Hello, my name is Adam. In this video, we are going to learn how to make the original Donkey Kong in Unity. Donkey Kong is a 1981 arcade video game released by Nintendo. Its gameplay maneuvers Mario across platforms to ascend a construction site and rescue Pauline from the giant gorilla named Donkey Kong, all while avoiding or jumping over obstacles. It is the first game in both the Donkey Kong and Mario franchises. This will be a simplified version of the game with the intention of teaching simple concepts that can be used when making any game. We will learn how to make a character controller, handle physics, and support multiple levels. If you need help at any point in the tutorial, feel free to join our Discord community where we can offer direct help. There's a link in the description of the video. Please consider subscribing to the channel to support the amount of effort it takes to create a video like this one. It is completely free, but it helps me a ton. Thank you. Enjoy the video. All right, let's begin by creating a new project using the Unity Hub. In the top right corner, we can click the new button to create a new project. You can also click the drop down next to it to select the specific version of Unity you want to use, depending on which versions you have installed. I'm going to be using Unity 2020.3 for this tutorial, although it won't really matter. We won't really be utilizing any specific features. So pick your version. From here, we can select the 2D template since this is going to be a 2D game. We can name our project whatever we would like. So in my case, I'm gonna call it Donkey Kong. Decide wherever you want to save your project and go ahead and click the create button. This might take a couple minutes to initialize, so we'll pick it up as soon as it's finished. Once your project has finished initializing, you should see something like this. The very first thing I'm going to do is import some custom sprites that we will use throughout our project. You can use the same sprites I will be using. You can download them from GitHub. There's a link in the description of the video. I definitely encourage you to use your own sprites as well. Um, it's one way you can make the game unique to you. But if you are going to use the same sprites as me, um, if you open up the GitHub page, there will be a download link, which will download the entire project. And within that project, look for the assets folder, the sprites folder, and this will contain the same sprites I'll be using. All right, so let's go ahead and import these. But first, let me create a folder to store all of my sprites just to keep my files organized. And then I will drag these into my project. I'm going to select all of my PNGs here and drag these in. And there is all of our sprites. We do need to change some settings on these files though, or on these assets. So I'm going to select all of them. I'm going to change the pixels per unit to 16. This is specific to these assets. I designed all of them to be 16 pixels per unit. It might be different if you are using your own custom sprites. I'm going to also set this to be full rect. I'm going to change the filter mode to be points because these are all pixel graphics or pixel art. I don't want any filtering applied, so we can set that to point to remove filtering. And then from here, I'm going to set the compression to none. These are all pretty small images, so the compression will only start to distort the, the graphics a little bit. And then for max size, I can maybe select 128 because once again, all of these images are fairly small. Let's go ahead and apply those changes. Now for just two of these, the ladder and the platform, I want to set the wrap mode to repeat. And that is because these two assets will be tileable. And so I need them to be, I need the textures or the sprites to be repeatable. We can apply that. And that is it for importing our sprites. Next, I want to create a bunch of prefabs that we can use for our game. A prefab is a prefabricated game object that becomes an asset that you can then reuse throughout your entire project. This will be important for our game here because there will be multiple levels and I want to be able to reuse the same assets for those different levels. So let's go ahead and just go down the line here and create a prefab for each of our respective objects. I can drag our barrel into our scene here and this is going to automatically create a game object with a sprite renderer component. It's going to assign that sprite to, to our sprite renderer here. And then from here, we want to add a few other components. So for one, I'm going to want to add a rigid body 2D to this object. 
a rigid body makes this a physics object. So that means the this object will be simulated by the physics engine. For now, we won't change any of these properties, but we will probably change some later. Next, I want to add a circle collider 2D. A collider defines the shape of the collision area of this object. And so since this is a circular shaped object, that's why I'm using the circle collider. There is also box collider, capsule collider. There are different shaped colliders that you could use depending on the type of object. We can see the green outline here is representing the is representing our collider. All right, that's it for now for our barrel. So to turn this into a prefab, well, first let's create a folder for our prefabs, once again, to keep our files organized. And all we need to do is drag this object from our hierarchy into our project panel, and now it becomes a prefab. And once I have this prefab, I don't need it in our scene anymore, so we can then delete it. And let's continue doing this for some of our other sprites here. So let's do Donkey Kong. And for Donkey Kong, we really just need a box glider. So I'm gonna add a box glider 2D. And that's it for now. So let's go ahead and drag that into our scene or into our project panel. We can then delete it from our scene. Let's move on to our ladder. For our ladder, we are going to want to add a box glider 2D. And for this one, we want it to set it, we want to set it to be a trigger. A the difference here between a trigger and a non-trigger is that a with a non-trigger, when another object collides with this, let's say here, let me kind of illustrate it. Let's add Mario to our scene. So let's say Mario collides with our um, with our ladder here. When Mario hits the ladder, he will come to a stop. He will come to a stop as soon as he hits that object. They're not able to go through each other because they are, you know, it's like almost like a wall. It, but now when it's a trigger, it still allows the objects to overlap one another, but we can still detect when those two objects have collided. This will be important because Mario needs to actually be able to climb up the ladder. And so he, they do need to actually overlap one another. So there will be a trigger. And let's see, I also want to change the draw mode from simple to tiled. And now from here, you can see if I change the height, we can make our ladder as tall or short as I want. And this is why we changed the ladder um, wrap mode to repeat. By default, I'm just going to set the height to be one. That's a pretty good size. And notice how our green box here, which represents our collider, does not fill the entire area properly. So anytime we change our size on our sprite render, we're going to want to change the same thing on our box collider to make those a little bit more uniform. So that looks good for now. And now finally, I'm going to set the color of our sprite here. You can really set it to be whatever you want. I'm going to use a cyan color. So here's the hexadecimal if you want to use the same as me. The reason why I made these sprites white is because it gives us the flexibility of setting the color to be anything we want. So that is it for our ladder. Let's go ahead and drag this into our folder here. Perfect. Then we can remove it from our scene. Okay, next let's go into, uh, let's do our platform next because it's very similar to the ladder. Drag that in. Let's add a box collider. Now this one, we don't want to be a trigger because we want Mario to actually be able to stand on top of the thing and not overlap with it. And then we can set the color as well. Well, first let's set the draw mode to tiled. And for this one, we'll be changing the width instead. So once again, we can make it as big or small as we want. By default, I'll just keep it at one. And same thing, if we do change our width, we want to make sure we change the width of our box glider to match. And let's set our um, platform's color as well. We can maybe set this to be a pinkish reddish color. That's the hexadecimal I'll be using. Feel free to make it whatever you want. And that is it for now for our box glider. So let's go ahead and drag that into our scene. Or I'm sorry, for our platform. And then we can delete it. Now, let me show you one thing here. So let's say we have multiple instances of these objects. Right, so I had several ladders, several platforms. 
we can still customize each of these separately. So for example, if I set the color, I can change the color for each of these individually if I want to. And so for different levels in our game, we could reuse these assets, but just override this one property. And notice how, notice when I'm, because I'm overriding this property, it shows this little blue rectangle on the side, and it also bolds that property to indicate that it has been changed from the original prefab. All right, so let's continue on. Let's do our, let's do Mario next. I'm gonna start with the Mario run one sprite, although it doesn't really matter too much. For Mario, we're gonna want a rigid body because he will also be a physics object and he we will move him via the rigid body and let's add a collider we'll use a capsule collider for mario um and let's change the size in the x axis to 0.5 and so you can see this better kind of aligns with the shape of mario or just any kind of humanoid figure a capsule collider usually works pretty well I'm actually going to make this a little bit bigger. So maybe do 0.65 and that, that looks to kind of fill the shape a little bit better. So that looks good. I'm just going to rename this from Mario for, from the name of the sprite to just Mario. And I can also set the tag here to be player. Player should already be a predefined tag. Let's go ahead and set that. And that's good enough now for Mario. Let's drag him into our, into our prefabs folder. And then we finally just need one more, which is going to be our Princess Pauline here. Let's drag her in, and she just needs a box glider 2D. And that is it. So we can drag her into our prefabs. And there are all of our prefabs that we'll use for our game. And so we'll be able to reuse these across all the different lever levels and so on. All right, now that we have all of our prefabs set up, we can start designing our levels. I'm gonna go to our scenes folder. I'm gonna rename sample scene here to level one. And from here on our main camera, I want to change our background color from the default blue to just be pure black. And I also want to set our size from five and I wanna increase that. If you see this white outline, this is indicating the area that our camera can see. If I were to change the size, it's going to make that area bigger or smaller. I'm going to set this to be 7.5. This is going to give us a little bit more space to work with for our scene. All right, now from here, it's really just a matter of dragging in our different prefabs into our scene and laying them out however we want to form our level. I'm going to be designing or kind of mimicking the very first level of Donkey Kong. You really can design your level however you want. That's kind of one of the creative parts of this game. So you don't have to follow the original game exactly. However, we will be writing code for that very first level to have the barrels kind of fall down the platforms. They'll kind of roll down them. So if you design your level differently, that might not make sense. It'll just depend. But let me show you how to go about doing this. So let's say we drag in our platform into our scene. And then from here, I can reposition this. Let's say we'll start at the bottom. Maybe that's negative six. Then I can change the width here. And we don't want to change the scale because that this is going to stretch the object in a way we don't want. We want to change the width on our sprite render. Let's say maybe 13. And then because I've changed that, I want to make sure I'm changing the box collider to match. So we can set that to be 13. And in the very first level of Donkey Kong, these platforms are slightly angled because the barrels will kind of roll down them. So I can change our Z axis rotation here. Let's say to, you know, two. Um, and one thing, this will come into play later, but notice when we're setting the position here, this red arrow, this is indica indicating the right, um, you know, in code, when you say transform.up, it's representing this green arrow. When you say transform.right, it's representing this red arrow. We're gonna use this red arrow to determine how the barrel falls down our platform. So I actually want this to be reversed. I want the red arrow to be pointing to the left to indicate that's the direction the barrel will roll. And so I'm gonna change our Y rotation. I'm gonna just flip this entirely. And so like if I just set it to 180, 
it'll be completely flipped. And then in, I guess instead of two, it'll be negative two for the rotation. And so now our red arrow is pointing in the direction our barrel will roll. So that'll come into play a little bit later, but just wanted to show you that. And so we'll really, we're just gonna follow this exact same process for our entire level. We'll just keep dragging in our objects into our scene, place them where we want, and then go from there. All right, so I've finished putting together our first level here. It's designed just like the original game. Let me show you what I did a little bit. So I've added Mario at the bottom, I've added Donkey Kong at the top, as well as Princess Pauline. I've added various ladders and then my platforms. Um, now specifically, the platform at the very bottom is size, has a size of 13, whereas all the other platforms have, have a size of 12. And then with that, the platforms will sort of alternate between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5 as an offset. This will give them space for the barrels to fall and then land on the platform below. So just giving a little bit of offset there, kind of alternating between each. Same thing too with our rotation. They kind of alternate between zero and 180. Basically, we're making sure this red arrow is always pointing in the direction that the barrels will fall. And so that will become important later. These top two don't really matter as much. And then for our ladders, let me go ahead and rename all these to just ladder. For our ladders, most of them are actually have a size of 1.25. Um, and then some of them have a size of 1.5. I think these ones in the middle are a little bit bigger. Now I'm actually noticing something that I want to fix. We can see that our ladders are actually in front of our platforms. And I kind of want them to be behind. So one of the ways we can do this is by changing the order and layer of our sprite renderer, which is under this additional settings here. Now we want to change both the platforms and the ladders because we want Mario to always be on top. So let's say Mario is at zero. Then we could set our platforms to be negative one and then our ladders to be negative two. And so now our ladders are behind. It's a small little difference, but it looks a little bit better that way. And then Mario will always be on top because his order and layer is bigger. Okay, now that our level has been designed, let's go ahead and start writing our first set of scripts. So for any platforming game, a character controller script is going to be extremely important. It's gonna be one of the main ways we define the feel of our game. So let's go ahead and start with that script and take a look at how it works and how we can customize it. First, I'm gonna create a folder to contain all of my scripts. And I'm gonna right click, create C Sharp script. I'm gonna call this player. You might be tempted to name it character controller. However, there actually is a built-in component called character controller. So you won't be able to use that same name. Um, that character controller component is actually used for 3D games, so we can't utilize it for this. That is okay, because I'll show you how to implement our own. With our player script here, by default, Unity creates us a class that inherits from model behavior, and they provide a couple functions that are commonly used. I actually like to just delete everything and start from scratch, um, or at least with our class here. So for a character controller, we will need a reference to our rigid body that exists on, um, on Mario. It is through the rigid body that we will be able to move Mario. And the rigid body, once again, turns this object into a physics object. Therefore, it'll be simulated via the physics engine. Um, it's also what handles collision detection, which is really what's important to us. So to get a reference to our rigid body, we can declare a variable here. Um, this will be a private variable. I'm going to call it rigid body 2D. I'm just going to name it rigid body. Notice immediately we get a warning here saying that this variable hides an inherited member called um, component rigid body. That's because there's actually a variable already declared with this exact same name within some of our base classes here. And so it says, hey, this is a problem. 
that property that already exists is actually completely obsolete it's really really old unity thing from way back in the day and so one of the ways we can get rid of this warning is to either just name this something else or we can also use the new keyword here and this is going to specifically say hey we want to treat this as a new variable rather than something that's trying to like override the existing one and then we're going to add a function called awake which is a built-in unity function that will get called automatically when this script essentially gets initialized and it is in here we use the established references to other um, components that might exist on this game object so we can use the function get component and then we can specify the type of component we want to get so what this is going to do is it's going to look on the same exact game object that our script is a part of and it's going to try to find a component that matches the type we specified and so one thing we actually need to do is we need to add our script to the game object and let's make sure we add it to the prefab because we want it to be part of every instance of mario so go to our prefab and let's drag that this script into the empty area at the bottom and now this script will run as part of mario and let's go back and continue editing this. So we have a reference to our rigid body, which will be important to be able to move our object. And let's also now define a variable to store the direction of our player here. And this will be a vector too, and we can just call it direction. This is gonna tell us which way Mario is moving, left, right, up, down, etc. All right, now in our update function, this is another built-in Unity function that gets called every single frame the game is running. It's commonly where you do things like check for input, which is exactly what we're going to do. So we can set our direction, both the X and Y axis separately using our input class. This is actually using Unity's old input system, which is still the default. Um, eventually, I'll do some tutorials using the new input system, but it's a little bit more complicated. So for now, we're going to use the old one. And we can say get axis here, which is already already the first thing here. And this allows us to get a predefined input axis, which I'll explain in a moment. But initially, I'm just going to call this horizontal. And then for our Y, it's going to be the same thing, but it's going to be vertical. And so in our project, if we go to edit project settings, let me drag this over here. In our project settings, we can go to the input manager and there's all these predefined input axes as they're called. And for example, we can see horizontal, vertical. You can actually see it show up multiple times. And that's because for one of them, it's defining, um, it's defining it with the keys. So left, you know, your arrow keys, W, A, S, and D. Whereas the other ones are defining it with joysticks. So if you were to use a controller, it would work. So this is how you can have multiple different um, input devices um, to read read from. Keyboard, controller, etc. And we use this name here to, to get that specific value. Now, another thing we might want to do is multiply this value by some movement speed. So we could have a public float called um, maybe move speed and maybe by just as a default we can set this to well, we'll set it to one as a default um, and then we can customize that in the editor but we can then take this and set the move speed here all right let's take a look at what this well actually no we need to do one more thing first so we're setting our direction but we're not really doing anything with that direction so this is where we need to then take this direction and apply it to the rigid body. So let's add one more function called fixed update. The difference between these two is that fixed update is ran at a fixed time interval. Um, and this will always run perfectly in sync with the physics engine. But usually anytime you're doing physics related things, such as changing a rigid body, you will want to do it in fixed update. That way it's in sync with the physics engine. We don't necessarily want to do it in update because update runs every single frame. But that means if you, the frame rate of your game is changing, you're going to get inconsistent results, which we don't want. 
So in fixed update here, we can say rigid body. And then there are different ways we can move an object. We can add forces, which is commonly what we do. But I find that moving, doing a character controller with forces is really tough to make it feel right. It requires a lot of tweaking to get it to feel right. And you just don't have as much control over your character as you would want. So instead of using add force, we can use the function move position. Really, this is a function that exists for us to essentially manually move the object, but it will still do the collision detection, which is really the important thing that we want. So when moving the position, we just want to take whatever our current position is and then add our current direction to that. And then finally, we want to multiply this whole thing by time.fixed delta time. This way, it will be uniform every single time this gets called. And that's really it. Let's go ahead and test this out initially. Um, on Mario here, we can see our script. Move speed is one. Let's play it and just see what happens. So I can move. My character is spinning around, which we don't want. I can move up and down, left, right. So not quite there yet. One thing I want to do is set our constraints here. So we can freeze the rotation to prevent Mario from spinning around like that. And another thing you can see is I can just move up and down freely, which is not really what I want. So this is really, you only really should be able to move left and right. And then we'll have a separate jump ability, which will, you know, we can then simulate gravity with. So I actually don't need this line of code. We, well, we will use this line of code, but it'll come later once we do climbing. But we're going to implement that separately. So let's comment that out. Let's rerun it. And now we got at least some basic movement, um, you know, collision detection. I can go up and down. My speed is a little slow. So maybe let's change Mario's speed to maybe like three. And once again, I'm changing this on the prefab. Yeah, and that feels a little bit better. Now from here, I also want to set the direction Mario is, not the direction, but the rotation to match the direction. So if I'm moving left, I want him to be facing left. So what we can do for that is in our update, if the direction dot X is greater than zero, so that indicates we're moving to the right. Well, then we will set our transforms um, Euler angles here. And actually, our character already is facing to the right. And so in this case, we can just set this to zero, factor 3.0. Now, if we're moving to the left, which would be X is less than zero, well, then we can set our Euler angles to be a new vector 3, where the X is zero, the Y will be 180, and then the Z will be zero as well. Let's go ahead and test that out. And there we go. Now, as I move, it feels way better already. So there's some very, very basic movement. All right, now that we have our basic movement in place, we can go ahead and implement some jumping. Let's go ahead and go back to our player script. I'm going to start by adding a variable called jump strength. And this will be a float. I'm just going to default it to one for now. This is essentially going to indicate how high can Mario jump. Um, and then with that, in our update function, we need to check for input again. And I'm going to do this before we check for our horizontal input. And we can say if input dot get button down. So here we're not getting an access value. We're just getting basically your true or false. Did you press a button? And if you have pressed a button, then we need to jump. And just like we did, we need to provide a name of one of our defined inputs in the input manager. Um, so we'll call this jump. And there happens to already be a, um, there happens to already be a value in here for jumping. And it defaults to be the space bar. There's also a binding for uh, controllers too, which is nice. So when you jump, we should set our direction to be vector two dot up because we're going to jump upwards. And then we can multiply this by our jump strength, 
which is good. All right, now the issue is when we jump, we're going up, but there's never anything to pull us back down. And that's where gravity comes into play. So we can say else, if you know, if we if you're not pressing jump on that frame, well then we want to always be applying gravity. So we can say direction plus equals physics 2D dot gravity. And then we want to time this by del time dot delta time. Because gravity here, if we're applying this every single frame, that, that number is going to be large and gravity is going to be just way too, way too much. We need to spread it out over time, which is what this is doing. It's also going to make it consistent regardless of our frame rate. If you want to customize what that gravity value is, you can go to your project settings and in the physics 2D, you will see the gravity is the first thing here. And it's defaults to negative 9.81, which mimics real life. Go to our Mario prefab and we have our jump strength here. This should be defaulted to one, but we can change it. So I've already played around with it and a value of four is much better. A value of one just won't, isn't enough. You do this little tiny baby hop, a value of four should be a little bit more accurate. Let's go ahead and test this out and see what happens. So I can jump, great. Gravity pulls me back down. Now there's an issue here where I can't move left and right anymore. I can move in the air, but I can't when I'm on the ground. So why is that? If we, in our inspector, if we switch to debug mode, we can see our direction here. Let me go back. Let me select Mario in our scene, not Mario the prefab. You can see our direction is just compounding and compounding and compounding. And so that force is pulling us down way more than our left and right direction. And so it's just kind of overriding it in a sense. And so we need to prevent that from happening. We don't ever want our gravity to compound too much. And so what we can do is let's get rid of this line of code and replace it instead with direction.y is going to be the max of whatever our current direction y is and negative one. So max returns which of two values is larger. So we're checking what is larger, our current direction y or negative one. So essentially what this is doing is it's saying our direction y will never exceed negative one. It'll always be negative one or greater. And greater would be pushing us up. So we don't ever, we don't want it ever to be like negative a hundred like it was, because that would just be pulling us down way too much. So this will make sure gravity is never like super compounding. Um, let's try this again, see if we can move around. Yeah, so now I can move around, I can still jump, great. And there's a weird issue here where it feels like I'm just like floating. Um, it just kind of feels like I'm floating down. And this might be because we still are using gravity on our rigid body as well. You we probably should turn that off. Because we're moving Mario sort of manually, um, using the move position instead of via forces, we don't really need to rely on these values like gravity scale on our rigid body. So we can get rid of that. We actually should have set our drag back to zero as well. That was that relates to our rotation, which we turned off. But regardless, we should set that. All right, so this looks good. Oh, so the issue here, the reason it's it feels like I'm kind of slowly floating down is because I said it should never exceed negative one. So what we are going to do is we only want to run this line of code if Mario is grounded. If he's grounded, we don't want it to continue to compound. But when he's in the air, it should keep going and going. Because gravity is an acceleration. So it does build up more and more over time. But as soon as we touch the ground and become grounded, well, then we want to start executing this. So yeah, that's our next step is to figure out if Mario is grounded or not grounded. There is a bit of complexity to that. So we're going to have a whole section on it. All right, so to check if Mario is actually grounded or not, we can determine if his collider is overlapping with other colliders and then check, are those other colliders, you know, a grounded uh, object like the pile? Is it a platform? Um, and that will determine if we are grounded or not. Let's go ahead and let's start by adding a new function that's gonna contain all of this logic. 
I'm going to move it into its own function because there will be quite a bit to it. And so it's going to be a little bit more readable. Um, so we'll call this check collision. And this, I want to call this as the very first thing we do in update. It's important that we figure out if Mario is grounded before anything else. So what we can do is use the functions provided in the physics 2D class. And so specifically there's some called like overlap box. It's actually three different versions of it. The first one's gonna just find the first collider that we're overlapping with. This is a problem because we could potentially be overlapping with multiple colliders. And so this might not give us accurate results. So that's where overlap box all comes into play. This will return an array of colliders we're overlapping. There is one kind of issue with this though, and in, in that it returning an array produces a lot of garbage. Um, it has to allocate memory for this array every single frame, since we're calling it every single frame. And that just produces a lot of garbage, which could lead to lag spikes and just performance problems with our game. For this game, because it's such a small game, it's probably not a big deal, but it's not a good practice to do this. So I'm going to show you how to do it the right way, which is to use overlap box non-alloc. So this is meaning this function will not allocate any memory, which is good. We don't want to allocate any extra memory every frame if we don't need to. And so the way this works is instead of it returning the array, we're going to provide an array for us that's already been pre-instantiated and it will then populate that array for you. And so what this means is we can instantiate the array once for the entire game rather than having it to instantiate it for us every single frame. So let's go ahead and add a variable for that. It'll be collider2d array, we'll call this results. Um, and we're also gonna need a reference to our collider component so we can get the size of it because that will be one of the parameters needed for this. So let's go ahead and add collider 2D. I'm just gonna call this collider. It's gonna give us the exact same warning we got when we added our rigid bodies. So I'm gonna add the new keyword there. We can go ahead and get component here, collider 2D. All right, so let's start implementing the various parameters. We need a point. So this is the point in space that we wanna check for overlaps. So this will just be the position of our character. We need a size here, which we can get from our Collider 2D. However, we're gonna change this up a little bit. And is this a Vector 2 or Vector 3? It's a Vector 2. So initially we can say Collider.Bounds.Size. But I wanna change this a little bit. If we take a look at Mario's Collider, I want to, so when Mario's standing on our platform here, there may be cases where it technically is not overlapping which would indicate Mario's not grounded, but he clearly is grounded in this case. And so what we can do is just pretend like our collider is a little bit bigger than it actually is. And this way it will give us more accurate results. And so to do that, we can just say size.y plus equals maybe you know 0.1 unit. Just give that little extra buffer to make sure we're getting accurate results. And then similar, similarly, we want to do sort of the, I guess the opposite for our width. We want to pretend like our width is smaller than it actually is. This will be important later on when we do climbing. Let's say right here in this case, technically our collider is overlapping with the ladder. So we would be able to start climbing, but visually it looks like we're not even on the ladder. So that would be a little weird. So we can pretend like our size is actually smaller than it really is. That way Mario needs to be more visually on top of the ladder in order for it to detect that collision, be able, be able to climb up. So in our scene here, we want to keep it how it is. Um, but when we do this um, overlap, we want to change it. So size X, we'll just divide it by two, we're just gonna cut it in half to make it smaller. So once again, that's, that's just gonna make it feel a little bit better, provide a little bit more accurate results and match it up visually to the character a little bit better. We need an angle here, or we don't need an angle, so we can just set it to zero. And then we can provide our results array. Now we need to make sure we're allocating this array initially. So in our awake function, we can say new collider 2D, 
then we need to provide a size for this array which is going to determine the maximum amount of things we could be overlapping with for us a number a max amount of four should be plenty sufficient um, it'd be pretty hard for mario to be overlapping with more than four things at once and even if they were it wouldn't really change anything so four is good for us now you'll notice this returns an integer so this is going to tell us how many things did we actually overlap with and then we can use that to loop over our array so we can say for int i equals zero i is less than the amount of objects we overlapped with all right and then from here we need to check okay what did we overlap with was it the was it a platform if it was a platform well then we know we're ground we've we're grounded um but we need a way of determining one object or distinguishing one object from another so one way we can do this is using the layer properties here um we can add some layers let's go ahead and add layer let's add one for what we'll just call this ground and that should be good for now and then we can set this and we're setting this on our prefab that way it'll apply to everything we can set this to be ground and so now we can check for that in our code here so we can check um uh, well first let's get a reference to the object we hit so or that we overlapped with we can say results i that game object and so we can now check that layer if hit dot layer equals layer mask dot name to layer ground great now we can set our character to be grounded um, now we don't have a variable for that, so let's go ahead and add, let's go ahead and add a variable for that. Um, so let's add a private Boolean called grounded. Maybe. All right. And then this can get set to true. Perfect. Now there's a slight issue with this, Well, there's actually two kind of small issues. One is that our, um, well, yeah, yeah. So one problem is that let's say when we jump, we're gonna bonk our head on the platform above. And so we might overlap with that platform for a frame or two, which would then think we're grounded when we're really not. So we wanna make sure that the object that we collide with is below us and not above us. So we're only gonna set grounded to be true if our hit transform position y is less than our character's position y so this is saying is the ground that we just hit is it below us um, if it's less than our character's position that means it's below us now there's another slight issue with this which is that the position of our character is right in the middle of mario we really should be checking at his feet to get more accurate results so we can offset that position by half a unit and that will give us those more accurate results. And we need to set Mario back. So um, here we can say minus half a unit and this is gonna give us some accurate, more accurate results. And so good, this this works pretty well. Um, Round to get set to true or false depending on the thing we hit. One thing we should do actually is assume we're not grounded every frame we're going to initially say we're not grounded and then it will get set to true if we um overlap with an object you know, with a platform below us all right from there well let's test this out let's just see that this works we select mario i'm going to go to our debug mode in the inspector by right? clicking the three dot menu there and going to debug we can see that grounded property so let's check that it gets set to true or false correctly. So for now, it's true, which is accurate. If I jump, it gets set to false, and then it gets set back to true. Perfect, so that's good. Now we can finally go back and utilize this variable um, in a few different places. The so one, we should only check for our jump input when we're on the ground. We don't, for this game, we're not gonna be supporting like a double jump. Um, so you can only jump if you're currently on the ground. So we can add that as part of our condition there. And then 
if you remember this line of code this is making sure our gravity isn't compounding too much but we only want to do that if we're on the ground if we're in the air we do want it to compound because gravity acts as an acceleration um, so only if we're grounded will we basically stop our direction from compounding too much go ahead and test this out and there we go so our gravity is back to normal which is good and everything's working great now one thing you'll notice is i kind of bonk my head and i almost like float there for a second which doesn't feel very good so what we could do is actually turn off collision between mario and the objects above us when we're jumping or when we're not grounded so we just need one extra line of code to do this here when we've determined that we have touched a ground or a platform um, we can then turn off collision um, if that object is above us and we know if it's above us, uh, it's above us if it's the opposite of this so if this is getting set to true then we know the platform is above us if grounded is ends up being false so what we can do is say physics 2d dot ignore collision we're going to ignore a collision between mario so our collider mario's collider and the this object that we're um this object that we are overlapping with a so results i and we'll say ignore collision true or false depending on if we're grounded or not grounded so if we're not grounded we want to ignore collision because that means we're jumping and we don't want us to bonk our head we're going to ignore collision when we're not grounded and that's it there so let's go ahead and test this out set this back to normal mode and yeah so now look so now when i jump i clip through it which maybe you think is weird but i think it makes the game feel better it kind of makes it feel and play a little bit better and i can't jump high enough where i could like go all the way through you know so it works out pretty nicely okay the next thing to do to complete our character controller is to do climbing and we pretty much have all the pieces in place, so this should be um, a lot easier than, than what we just did, because we can kind of use the same code. So instead of checking if we have collided with a ground object, we can check if we've collided with a ladder. So for example, we can say else if we have hit a um, ladder here, well then maybe we can set some ladder or climbing boolean so we can have a boolean called climbing and we can set that to be true um, if we are climbing or if, if we are currently colliding with a ladder then climbing is true and once again we want to assume that we're not climbing up front so we're going to always set this to be false initially and then as it goes through all the objects we're colliding with it'll get set to true if indeed we are touching the ladder now we need to set this layer on our ladder prefab. Let's go back to prefabs um, and let's go to our ladder here and let's add a new layer. I wanna call this one ladder. And then let's go back and let's assign that. You'll notice we're getting a warning saying the climbing variable is assigned, but it's never used. Makes sense. We haven't actually done anything with that variable yet. Let's go ahead and do something with it. So, if we are climbing, this is when we want to check for our vertical input like we originally did. And if we are climbing, we don't want to be jumping. We don't want gravity. Um, so we want to add this here and then make this an else. So if we are climbing, we'll do something else. We can then potentially jump or as well apply gravity. Um, Right, so if we're climbing we will set our direction y to be it's the same line of code we originally wrote when we first did our character controller so we're checking for vertical input timesing it by our movement speed and we're good there and i think that's literally all we need let's test it out we're moving select mario here i can still jump I can then go up ladder and climb up it. Perfect. And I could jump onto a ladder 
and there we go so it works perfectly so there we go we have kind of completed our kind of basic character controller let's go ahead and give mario a little bit of animation to really tie everything together in terms of his movement so let's go to our player script and we're going to need a few more variables here and we're starting to get a lot of variables so let me just kind of organize these a little bit more um, to make it easier to read just going to separate those out into different groups and i'm going to add a few more at the top here for animation purposes so one we're going to need a reference to our sprite renderer because we're going to be changing these sprites in order to animate um, mario then we're going to need an um an array of sprites that will kind of make up his run like so we'll call this run sprite so when he's running or moving um we will kind of cycle through this array of sprites and then we also want a sprite when he's climbing um so we'll call this just like climb sprite and when as it relates to this array as we kind of cycle through it we need to keep track of which sprite we're currently on via the arrays index so we'll have a variable for that we'll call this just sprite index and i realize this can be private the others will be or these two will be public because we need to assign them in the editor our sprite renderer can get assigned in awake just like the other components we're getting a reference to okay now to animate um, mario we just need to basically um, set the sprite on this renderer every x amount of seconds um, so what we can do is when mario is enabled we can invoke a function repeatedly and there is actually a built-in um, function for this so unity has a function called invoke repeating which just allows us to call some other method every you know one second two second etc um we need that other function we're going to call so let me create that first i'm going to add it at the very bottom i'm just going to call this like animate sprite and we'll come back to that but here we need to provide the name of that function and so i like to say name of animate sprite then we need to provide what's the initial amount of time before that gets called um, let's just say this will get called every like 12th of a second. Um, so we can say one divided by 12 will be 12th of a second. And then it's going to repeat every 12th of a second as well. So the, these two will just be the exact same. And then when our, if, when, or if our character ever gets disabled on disable, we will cancel the invoke to stop him from animating. And these get called automatically by Unity whenever this script gets enabled or disabled. So. All right, so in our animate sprite, we want to do a couple things. So for one, if we are climbing, we can just directly set our sprite to that climb sprite. So if we're climbing, we can say sprite renderer dot sprite equals our climb climbing sprite or our climb sprite. If we're not climbing, so else, we want to cycle through that array. So to cycle through the array, we want to increase our index. So we can say plus plus to increment it by one. If we ever get to the end of the array, then we want to loop back to the beginning. So we need to check that this index has not, or if it has exceeded whatever the length of our array is, then we need to set it back to zero to loop, loop from the beginning again. And then so we can say sprite render dot sprite now we're just going to assign whatever sprite is in the array at that index and that is it um now it's just a matter of assigning those different variables in our um, on mario let's make sure we do this on the prefab we can see our run sprites here is an array i'm going to set this to be um four different sprites <clears throat> and so really there's three different sprites for running but it's kind of cycles so Mar run one is kind of like idle then we go to run two and then we go back to run one and then we go to run three and then it goes back to run one so it's like 
one, two, one, three, one, two, one, three, one, two, one, three. And it just kind of cycles over and over. For our climb sprite, we can drag in that sprite there. And that should be it. So let's test it out and see what happens. So yep, now as I move around, Mario's actually animating, which looks good. And once I start climbing, he switches to the climb sprite, which is great. Perfect. So there is Mario being animated based on his movement. I actually just realized there is one bug with the animation, which is that if we're not moving, Mario still animates. So that is an issue. Let's go ahead and fix that real quick. In our player script, we go all the way down to our animate sprite here. We only want to actually animate Mario if he's moving, right? If he's not moving, we don't need to cycle through. So we can say here, else if our direction, and we really only care about him moving in the left and right, like so left and right, so the X axis. So if our X axis is not zero, which indicates we are moving, then we will continue the cycle of the animation cycle. Otherwise, if he's standing still, then he kind of just stays how he is. So if we play here, again, he's not animating. As once we start moving, he starts animating. Once we stop, he kind of stops. Perfect. Next up, let's implement our barrels and the barrel physics and whatnot. Now, this is sort of specific to this level. So if you designed your level differently, you might not even need to do this. But I will show you how we can have our barrels kind of fall down our platforms. Let's go ahead and add a brand new script called spawner. So there's kind of two aspects to this. One, we need to spawn the barrels and then we need to obviously move the barrels. But first, let's just focus on getting them to spawn. In this script, I'm gonna start fresh with an empty class here. And we need a couple variables. One is what is the game object we want to spawn? And this will be a reference to some prefab. So we'll call that prefab. I also want to determine how often does does that object spawn and maybe we won't want to make this a little bit random so we can have a min time and a max time so it'll be a random amount of time between a min and max and maybe it's every like two to four seconds as at least as a default we can customize these in the editor um, from here we need to implement a function called spawn which will be our own custom function um, but before we do that, let's add um, one more, which will be start. So when this script starts, this is a function Unity calls automatically. The very first frame that this script is enabled and running, this will get called. And we want to just initially spawn um, our object. So in spawn, we can say instantiate. This is going to make a copy of an existing object, that object being our prefab. We need to spawn it at some position, which will be wherever our spawner is located. So we can move the spawner in our scene wherever we, wherever we want, and that's where the objects will spawn at. And for the rotation, we don't actually care about that, so we can just set that to identity. And then from here, we just want to make sure that this is getting called again after some amount of time. So we can invoke this function invoke name of spawn after some amount of time this will be random so we can use unity's random class there's a function called range which will generate a random number between a min and max and that is all we need for our spawner let's go ahead and test that out itself let's add a empty game object to our scene called um maybe barrel spawner we can add this to it. I'm going to reset the position for now. Let's assign our barrel to, as the prefab object we're cloning. And let's position this object in our scene by Donkey Kong up there. So I'm going to say it's a 4.5 and maybe negative 3.25. So the barrels will spawn right there. That looks good. Let's go ahead and test that out. And yeah, perfect. So you can see they're spawning next to them. There is a little problem here where they are a little bit too big to fit in this gap. 
And I expected that. Um, and so what I wanna do is actually decrease the size of our barrels a little bit. I could also move the platforms, but I kind of like like how they are. The reason for this is I don't want Mario to be able to go over there, um, but I want, so I want, I want it to be small enough that Mario can't fit through the gap, but, but big enough that the barrels can. And so I just need to make the barrels themselves a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna maybe set the scale of these to the 0.8. Um, and I might also change the collider size, um, to be just a tad bit smaller, zero point, maybe three, five. Yeah. That looks a little bit better. It's a little bit smaller. Let's save that. Let's test that out one more time. Yeah. So there we go. Now it can go underneath and you can see them spawning. And because they are physics objects, they already are moving without us doing anything. Um, just be from the natural forces being applied, like gravity and such. Um, and that's something we can play around with if we want. Um, so, for example, I might want to get rid of angular drag. Um, angular drag is is how much drag is applied rotation-wise. Since I want these to always be rolling, I don't really want any drag at all. I don't want the rotation to ever slow down. So we can set that to zero. It was already pretty small, so it probably won't have a big impact, but... Um, now, one thing you'll notice here is as they roll off, they're going over and passing up um, the platform, which we don't want. So what we could do is add a little invisible barrier to prevent them from falling off. It'll also prevent Mario from falling off, which just simplifies some of the logic of the game. Let's go ahead and do that. If we add a, an empty game object to our scene, I'm going to reset the position. I'm going to just call this barrier. And we're just going to add a box collider, 2D. And that's it. And now we can position it in our scene. So let's maybe set the size to be 10. Um, let's set the X to be 7. So yeah, it lines up right there with the edge. That looks good. Um, and now it's going to hit that. It's going to hit that and fall down and then continue. And so we need the exact same thing on the other side. I'm just going to say negative seven. Um, and there's our two barriers. Um, and now this works too, because when it gets to the very end here, the barrel does still have enough space to fall off there. Um, but Mario will hit his head. And so Mario won't be able to walk off the edge either. All right. So yeah, if we try to move there, he won't be able to move. And let's see that our barrels should hit that invisible barrier and then boom they land and that looks great now one thing i don't really like is when they move to the next platform they kind of lose all their momentum and it takes them a while to kind of start moving again which for me it gives me as the player a lot of time to climb up because they're so slow so one thing I might want to do is implement a force or apply a force to the barrels every time they hit one of these platforms. And this is why in the beginning of our tutorial, when we were setting up our scene, that we made sure all of our platforms were facing the right direction. So the X axis here is always pointing in the direction they are rolling. We're going to use that to apply a force now. So let's add one more script. And we'll just call this barrel. Go ahead and open this up. And we're going to start fresh here, just like I usually do. And we need a reference to our rigid body, because um, that's where what um, that's how we can apply our force. So rigid body. We're going to get that same warning we got when we did our character controller. So I'll use the new keyword there. In our awake function, we can establish the reference to this. Get component, rigid body 2D. And then from here, what we can do is determine, or every time the barrel collides with one of these platforms, we will then apply a force to give it some more momentum. So we can say on collision enter 2D, and then it takes a parameter called collision 2D, and we'll name that collision. This function gets called by Unity automatically anytime our object collides with something. And we only want to apply this force if we collide with a gr the ground, like a platform. 
and not anything else. So we can do what we did in our player script, which is check the um, layer. We can say collision.gameObject.layer equals layer mask named layer ground. And so perfect. And so when we when a barrel touches the ground, it will apply a force. Bridge body add force in the direction of that platform or that that object. So collision transform dot right. So once again, the um, the right when you say transform dot right, it's re representing this red arrow. So we're applying a force in the exact direction that this platform is facing. This is why it was important to make sure these are set that way. And we did that by rotating some of them 180 degrees to kind of flip them. Um, so let's go back here. So we're going to apply our force in the direction of that. Maybe we have a variable called speed um, in case we want to multiply that. Uh, I will default it to one initially, but we can multiply that by some speed. And I want to apply this force as an impulse because we're only applying it at one, like one time versus applying it repeatedly every single frame. Um, so it's just kind of an impulse force that we're adding. And let's go ahead and test this out. Um, we need to add our script to our barrel prefab. Let's go to our barrel prefab, drag our barrel script into the empty space. And let's set the speed to be like five, maybe. And let's test this out. They should be a lot faster. Yeah, initially, boom, it's faster. Boom, as soon as it hits the platform below, it it kind of adds it, it adds a force to speed it up. And obviously, this isn't realistic. Like, it's not... The physics isn't realistic, but it makes the, um, it makes the, it, it works better for the game. It, it just kind of feels better and makes the gameplay better. Um, and so there we go. I think the next thing to do is to actually check when Mario collides with a barrel and, you know, you know, get a game over and things like that. So we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, we're getting a little bit close to finishing. Let's go ahead and start implementing our basic game manager. Go ahead and create a brand new script called game manager. And I'm going to create an empty game object in our scene and put this on it. Let's reset the position there. And we'll call this game manager. We are actually going to do something a little bit different with this. Um, in the next section once we start loading different levels but for now this will be fine go ahead and open this up i'm gonna start fresh like i usually do and so for our game manager this is going to keep track of you know how many lives do you have how much score do you have what level are you on starting a new game you know moving to the next level things like that so Let's start creating some of those variables. Um, so we need, for example, a variable for lives, a variable for score. Um, we're gonna do the level stuff in its own section, so I won't add any of that yet. When our game starts, or when this script first starts, um, we will start a new game. So let's have a function for new game. And we will call new game and start. When a new game is called, we will set our lives, let's say, to three and our score to zero. And then we need to load level one. Like I said, we're going to do the level loading in its own section, so I won't do that yet. I'll at least put a comment in here that says load level. Okay, and then really the only other thing we can do right now is determine when you have completed a level and when you have failed a level. Um, so let's have two functions for these. And we're going to make these public because th these events of completing and failing a level happen, you know, from a different script, our player. Our player, it's only through our player that we know if we've completed a level. And so we need to call these functions externally. So they need to be public. We're going to say level complete. And we'll have one for level failed. Okay. For level complete, 
you know, we can maybe increase our score, let's just say by a thousand points, you know, whatever you want to do there. And then we will eventually load the next level. We're going to, you know, we're going to do that separately. So I'll just put a comment for now. Um, when we fail a level, we should decrease our lives. We can decrement that by one. And then we should check if our lives is zero. Well, then we should probably start a new game again. And if our lives are not zero, we should reload the current level. Um, and once again, I will put a comment saying reload current level. But we'll revisit those. Um, let's at least verify that these are, will get called. Um, although we need to call them first. Let's go ahead and do that. In our player script, when our player collides with an obstacle, they will fail the level. And when they collide with the objective, they will complete the level. So let's implement our um, on collision enter 2D function, just like we did in our barrel, same, same function. Uh, collision 2D, call this collision. So if the object we have collided with is, let's say, um, object, you know, is this, well, so we need to figure out a way to determine what we collided with. There's a few different ways we could do this. For the physics related stuff, we use layers because layers are used for physics. For this kind of thing, we could probably just use tags. So for example, if we go to our barrel, we can set the tag here. Let's go ahead and add one. Um, and let's add one called obstacle. And let's also add one called objective. Okay, so for our barrel, we can tag it obstacle. And let's make sure we do this in our prefab. We can also talk Donkey Kong as obstacle. So if you ever were to touch Donkey Kong, that would be considered losing as well. Whereas our princess here, Paulina, she will be tagged as the objective. She's You're trying to reach her, and when you have reached her, you've completed the level. She's the objective. Um, and let's go back to our code now. So to check for the tag, we can say game object compare tag, and we can say objective. Okay. Or we can say collision game object compare tag is an obstacle okay and so when this happens we just need to call the respective function level complete or level failed and this you know these functions exist on a different component which we don't don't have a reference to we could just establish a reference um, here um, we also could do something like this find object of type game manager so this will search our our entire scene for for this object this is actually not the best practice because um this function is very slow you just gotta, i mean you just gotta be careful when using this kind of function because it's very slow you it's gonna look through everything in your entire scene to find this um to find this component here um for this game because it's so small it's not really a big deal and we're only using this um, on collision enter. It's the kind of thing you don't want to use like an update. You know, you don't want to be using a really expensive function like this every single frame. But here it's not a big deal. So we can say level complete. Um, and then when you do an obstacle, it will be level failed. And one thing we should do, whether you complete or fail the level, we should probably disable our player temporarily. So we'll set them to be not enabled. Um, that way you can't, you will not, you will no longer have control over the player, which makes sense. Um, Cause the, the level is gonna reset or you'll move to the next level anyways, in which case then you'll get re-enabled, but. Um, all right, let's test this out. We just need to verify that these two functions are being called and then we can go handle our multiple levels. Um, the way we can test this is by going to our debug mode and we have the lives and score there. And so we'll know if we um, have done this. Um, so let's go ahead and just let one of the barrels hit us. Boom, so our lives decreased to two. Yeah, and I lost control of my character, and yeah. 
let's do that again and obviously that looked a little bit weird but normally speaking we will reload the level and you know it'll be good then let me actually try to beat the levels to avoid these jump over that to go up I'm here and there's her and yeah our score increased so we can we've confirmed we are indeed calling both of these functions respectively so we are good there with our game manager for now all right so this should be the last step in our tutorial in which is to handle loading different levels or multiple levels so let's go to our scenes folder here and we have level one I'm going to duplicate this by pressing Control D, or if you're on Mac, you can do Command D. And let's rename this to Level 2. And so we can see up here which scene we're in, Level 2. Obviously, for now, I'm just going to keep it the same, but obviously we could redesign this, kind of reset up our platforms in um, a different manner. In the project I have on GitHub, I actually have gone and set up a um, a whole level two um, but for the sake of time right now i'm not going to do that um, but maybe at the very least just so i know which level i'm on i can just set all of these platforms to maybe be a different color um, maybe we'll make these like blue and our ladders like orange or something just just temporarily so we know which level is which if i can go between all right so we have level one, level two. We also need one more scene, and this is going to be a brand new scene. So we can right click, create scene, and I'm going to just call this like preload. What this is going to do is it's going to contain any game objects that need to persist across all levels. Really, all that is for us is our game manager. So we can actually delete our game manager from each of our scenes. And instead, let's open up this preload scene we can delete the camera we don't need that we just need our empty game object um that is our game manager and we can add our script to it um cool because what you can do in unity is have multiple scenes loaded at once so our preload scene will always be there no matter what and then we'll then load level one level two etc now, now that we have these different scenes, we need to make sure they all have been added to our game. And so if you go to file build settings, you can see right now only level one has been added. We should drag in our other scenes too. And it's very important that you set preload to be the first one. Um, so we can just drag that up. We need this to be the first um, scene that gets loaded when we start our game. All right, let's go to our game manager. And we need to replace these comments with actual code now. So, well, first, before we do that, there's one more line of code we want to add and start, which is called don't destroy unload. And then we need to pass a reference to our game object here. This is saying this, this game object, which contains our game manager script, will not be destroyed when we load a new scene. So this this game object will persist in will persist the entire time even if we switch to a different level that's super important all right now from here when we um in order to load a level let's add a function um, let's have a function called load level and let's pass in the index of the level we want to load and so here for example in new game we can say load level one and let me explain the index real quick. So usually indexes start at zero, um, which is why in our build settings, we could see the index here, zero, one, two. So preload is always zero. And then level one is one, level two is two, etc. So we know, hey, load level one is level one. And, you know, so when we complete a level, for example, we will say, you know, our next well actually let me back up we need a variable to keep track of what is our current level so we'll have that um and then when we complete a level we can say our next level is whatever our current level is plus one and then when we um 
basically then we just load that level however in donkey kong if you get to the very end and you like you you'll actually just loop back through and start at the beginning again but you'll maintain your score and stuff so we need to check if the next level like even exists if there is a next level then we need to load it if not we need to kind of loop back to the beginning so the way we can do this is by saying if our next level is less than our scene oh we need to import something we need to import using unity engine dot scene management okay now we can say if our next level is less than scene manager scene manager dot scene count in build settings remember in those build settings we have three scenes so this number will be three for us so as long as our next level is one of those three we can go ahead and load it we can load our next level otherwise if this value exceeds however many scenes we have in our build well that must mean we've reached the very end and therefore we should load the very first level again and start over cool now when we fail if we run out of lives well then we should um oh yeah well no we start a new game but if we fail the level but we still have some lives remaining we just need to reload whatever our current level is and so we're good there all right let's go ahead and actually implement the load level scene itself so the very first thing we want to do is actually assign our variable to be whatever that index is now from here to load a level we will say scene manager dot load scene and we can there's a couple ways to load a scene you can do it by the name of the scene or you could do it by the um, build index which is what we have so we can just say level now there's one thing i want to do here and that this is gonna kind of load I, I want like sort of a transition between them and the tris transition is really i kind of just want to make the screen go all black for like one second and then it'll load the level and then it'll come back so the way i can make this screen go all black is just by basically telling our camera not to render anything um so we can get a reference to our camera saying camera.main let's just make sure that that camera is not null this is important because when we first start the game we're going to be in our preload scene which doesn't have a camera and so it won't exist and so if we try to then access a property on this and it's null we'll get a null reference exception error so as long as the camera exists, we can just say camera.colling mask equals zero. This is just a way of saying for the camera not to render anything, which is basically just going to make the screen go all black. And then instead of loading our scene immediately, we can just kind of have a fake delay of like one second. So maybe we will have a separate function here called load scene where we will have that one line of code. And we can say to invoke that function after one second. So it's kind of just like a fake, like wait one second before loading the scene. Uh, so our screen will go black, a little kind of delay to almost pretend like it's loading and then it actually loads. And I think that's it for our game manager. Let's go ahead and test this out. Now, one thing that's really important here, now that we have this preload scene, this is where our game object exists. So we need to make sure we're running our game from here if we run from level one that game manager won't exist and so we won't be able to transition between levels and so on we'll get some errors so let's go to preload and play from there you'll notice here so initially it was black level one has loaded now and you'll see here don't destroy unload where which has our game manager that's that's good let's go ahead and test this out so if i get hit by a barrel it should the screen should go black for a second it should then um, reload again goes black boom it reloads the level which is perfect all right let's see that it goes to the next level if i beat this one jump over that jump over that and boom goes black and it loads level two and we know this is level two because i just changed the colors 
obviously you should actually redesign the level to be different in some way um but this is good and now let's verify that if i beat this level since it's the last technically the last level it should start back over again and there it goes it goes back to level one and so that is it that is our game of donkey kong it's sort of a simplified version of the game um, obviously it doesn't have all the mechanics but hopefully this was a way of teaching you just some techniques that you can use throughout any of your games um, obviously feel free to add new levels design them how you want you can add unique mechanics to each of the individual levels um, really take this and make it your own you know see how you can you can design this up oh, i got hit by the thing i died oh i got an error here that's a problem oh no i got an error because i did what i said not to do which is that i played the game from level one rather than playing the game from our preload and so on i got a null reference exception on line 125 will that open up let's go here on line 125 of our player find object of type game manager game manager doesn't exist I and mean, so i got a null reference so once again play the game from preload but you'll be good but anyways as i was saying yeah see how you can really make this game your own um but yeah i hope you enjoyed the tutorial i really appreciate you watching this tutorial and i hope you learned a thing or two along the way give the video a thumbs up or down to let me know how i did subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one and leave a comment recommending what you would like to see next if you want to support my work even more, you can become a Patreon member to receive exclusive benefits, including access to the unique assets that I develop. Link in the description of the video. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.